Uh, good morning to our invited speaker from the USA, Professor Alexander Venin, and the uh, audience from the USA. Uh, good afternoon to all who participate uh, from Sri Lanka. Uh, as the head of the department, Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeniya, and uh, on behalf of the INSPIRE team, I am happy to welcome all of you to our sixth INSPIRE webinar. Uh, we have a very special speaker, Professor Alexander Grenin, uh, for giving us an inspirational talk. Professor Grenin, uh, thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation, despite of your busy schedule. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Susanti Jayasingha to introduce Professor Alexander Grenin to the audience. Uh, it's over to you, Dr. Susanti. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, good evening, good afternoon to you all. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Alexander Grenin, for the sixth seminar of the Inspire Seminar Series. Professor Alexander received his BA degree from Lake Forest College under the research supervision of uh, Dr. William Martin in 2007. Then he uh, received his PhD in chemistry in 2012 from the University of Kansas. That is the place where I got chance to meet him as a batchmate. During his PhD, I was able to he was able to develop various decarboxylative and decarboxylative allylation reactions under the supervision of uh, Professor John Tangi, which resulted many good publications. So after his PhD, he moved to Boston University to work with Professor John Poco on complex molecule synthesis. And his main contribution was to develop new routes to PPAP natural products and analogs. Then he started his independent career in 2014 as the assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Florida. From that day onwards, he has been working on invention of novel uh, chemical methodologies to simplify the synthesis of complex molecules with the long-term goal of discovering natural product-based therapeutics. He was able to publish his research work in very high impact journals within this short period of time, as well as to uh, receive several grants. Today, he's going to talk about the 21st century cop rearrangement inspired by the historical report. Thank you very much, Alex, for accepting our invitation. It is over to you now. Thank you, Professor Susanti. It's great to see you. It's been a long time. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I also want to extend my gratitude to the entire INSPIRE uh, organizing committee um, for this invitation. It's really a pleasure to be able to talk science with um, fellow faculty and students. There's nothing, there's nothing better than this opportunity. So thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, I should say also good afternoon to all of you. It's uh, 730 in the morning here in Florida. So I'm now drinking my coffee. I managed to get my kids to, to school this morning and raced back to, to get here on time. I'm glad, I'm glad, it, I'm glad it all worked out. <clears throat> okay. Um, one quick uh, one quick uh, question of clarity, Professor Susanti. Um, should I be aiming for about a 45 minute talk or what's? Yes, Alex. Great, okay. I will share my screen here. And then we can have a question and answer session. After that, I think you were informed that we have a uh, meet the student like half an hour session as well. Oh, I look, I greatly look forward to it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right, as is tradition, I'm going to make sure you all can see my slides. Is that true? Yes, Alex, we can see. OK, great. OK, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm really honored to be here and tell you about the work of my, uh, that my, my, my team has developed. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a, a recent photo of the Grenning Laboratory. Kitten, you got to go. <laughs> Sorry, we have a Zoom bomber there. I closed the door. Now it's just now it's just us. Okay, here's the here's the recent Grenier Laboratory. I want to thank all of them for all of their hard work. 
Um, I have their names listed here, as well as uh, our funding agencies. So I want to thank the NSF and the NIH for funding our research. And of course, I need to thank my collaborators uh, throughout the years who has helped us push our chemistry forward. We are a synthetic organic chemistry laboratory. We are not computational chemists. We are not chemical biologists. We are not medicinal chemists. So we team up with those great people to help uh, make our, our research interdisciplinary. Um, let's see if I can, there we go. Uh, here's the Grenning Lab through the ages, starting in 2014. Um, uh, and actually, I'm going to tell you a lot about the, the work that's gone on during my assistant professorship and just sort of allude to some of the more recent stuff that's going on right now. Um, I'm happy to, to, to tell you all that actually I've had, I've had one Sri Lankan student in my research group, uh, Pramali Navaratne. She is uh, from Kandy, uh, a town which I'm sure maybe some of you are familiar with, and uh, she went to the, to the University of Colombo. Um, uh, and she was really an incredible student. Uh, I, I absolutely loved working with her. Here's her um, swinging a, a, a chromatography column. Everyone else is holding it like a baseball bat. You can see she's holding it like a cricket racket. Uh, maybe we can talk about that at a later point. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so on to um, uh, the topic at hand today, 21st century copy arrangements inspired by the historical report. That's what I want to talk about with you today. Uh, and I've clipped this image directly from the original um, paper published by Arthur C. Cope in uh, 1941. And it, it's drawn in a very kind of unusual way. These is, you know, these were done with stencils back in the day, hand drawn. <clears throat> okay, so this is how we used to sort of describe the Cope rearrangement. We have a double bond. We have an allyl group, C3, uh, C3 allyl group there. It undergoes a Cope rearrangement at 175 degrees. Okay, this is how we, we, we draw this reaction now. All right, this is the same reaction just done using um, some, some valuable tools um, on our computer, uh, namely ChemDraw or related drawing programs. Okay, so here is our 1,5-dyne. These nitriles are very important for the success of the reaction. This 1,5-dyne can be drawn in the flatland, um, though of course we know that this reaction proceeds through a uh, three-dimensional uh, transition state, uh, one of two possible um, enantiomeric transition states, uh, these Zimmerman-Traxler models, if you will, uh, where we're transferring the allyl group from the three position, one, two, three, to the one position in our product to get to our uh, um, gamma allyl alkylidine molonitrile product. Okay, so this is the reaction that was discovered by Cope uh, that we uh, think is a very valuable transformation. Okay, and we are not the only people to have studied this, of course, besides Arthur C. Cope, uh, his work in the 1940s. Uh, there was also a significant amount of research on 3,3-dicyano-1,5-dienes in the 70s, 80s, and even in the 2000s. Okay, I'm gonna walk you through these, some of these uh, more historical reports right now. Okay, so uh, here's some of the original substrates. Um, and here we have barriers to reactivity, okay? Uh, 25.8 kcals for the simplest 1,5 dienes to undergo cope rearrangement. Um, and so what this number tells you is that re the reaction requires heat. Um, if, a, if a barrier is around 22 kcals per mole, it will go forward at room temperature. So this is uh, four kcals above that. Um, and so you got you to heat these reactions up to about 150 degrees to make them go forward. The nitrile being an excellent electronic drawing group um, is the best. If you change a nitrile to an ester, the reaction becomes less favorable kinetically, uh, going up by a few kcals per mole. And finally, if you exchange one of the, one, one of the dienes of the 1,5-diene for a benzene ring, it becomes a uh, impossible reaction. Um, as drawn. These substrates are, are not very reactive. And of course, this is because you would have to de-aromatize the benzene ring. Okay, so essentially what the, the point here is I'm trying to make is, um, while there is a, a subclass of molecules that are very reactive, there could be kinetic and thermodynamic challenges associated with things beyond this uh, initial class of substrate that was discovered. Okay. Um, 
So we draw the one fire dyne like this. And the way that these are synthesized are from the alkylidine melanonitrile um, by deprotonation to form these allyl anions stabilized by two nitrile groups. And these uh, allyl anions can have two different geometries, either Z or E. And what Wigfield found in the 70s was that um, he was able to characterize these as the E alkene. So they react through this thermodynamically preferred orientation. He also some, uncovered some uh, structural limitations with these reactions. If you put a benzene ring on the sixth position of the 1,5-dyne, one, five dyne, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's why we call it the sixth position, um, that this reaction is no longer favorable either. Okay, so the, the, the version where there's a six hydrogen group here, uh, very favorable, now not favorable. And this is because, bear with me, here's a styrene group. Okay, so the benzene ring is conjugated to the alkene. For this to undergo co-rearrangement, you must deconjugate that styrene from the, the alkene from the benzene ring. And of course, we all know that um, resonance conjugation is significant and taking that away from a molecule is going to increase its ground state uh, compared to um, the conjugated variant. And so that's a penalty you have to pay. And so these become no longer thermodynamically uh, preferred. Uh, further, Wigfield also made this molecule, which has a, a tetra-substituted olefin, and upon Cope rearrangement would generate a bond that has a quaternary carbon adjacent to a tertiary, tertiary carbon, along with benzene, I'm sorry, styrene de-aromatization. No uh, Cope rearrangement was observed at any point. Okay, so I think this is again showing the, 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 the limitations of this uh, and that we need to think about, about how to going about improving the kinetics and thermodynamics of this transformation, which had not been done um, until uh, some of the research going on in my group. Okay, so why do we think that these COPE products should be valuable building blocks for chemical synthesis. Uh, and we think that for the following reasons. Uh, the two functional groups, alkene and alkylidine melanonitrile, are orthogonal functional groups that can be manipulated under pretty mild conditions in unique ways and in controllable ways. Uh, one example I'm showing here is from Lear and Hayashi. You can take, um, you can first reduce this alkylidine double bond selectively over this one, because this is uh, exceptionally electrophilic, right? So this is, can accept nucleophilic hydride sources such as sodium borohydride, whereas the alkene cannot, okay? And you treat them the monoalkyl melanonitrile with oxygen base and an amine, and you can first form an acyl nitrile by hydroxylation of the internal position here. That will collapse to form the acyl cyanide, these acyl cyanides function um, similarly to acyl chlorides. And so you can add a nucleophile such as, such as an amine to form an amide. Okay, so that's a really valuable functional group interconversion reaction that can be done on alkylidine mononitriles. And from there, of course, the alkene can be manipulated in a variety of different ways. So we see this as a platform for making molecules that look like this, where we can, where we can install one functional group and another onto a scaffold in a divergent sense. Okay, and uh, to this point, um, the substrates are also prepared in a highly convergent fashion. So you take your ketone, you do a canuvenagle condensation, followed by a deconjugative allylation to get to the 1,5-dyne. Okay, so it's a very simple synthetic sequence. The, the, the building blocks are also quite simple. And so if we rethink this, um, we can synthesize a variety of different COPE products from various ketones or aldehyde derivatives, if R1 equals hydrogen, and various allylic electrophiles, okay, um, throughout the sequence here. Okay, and so now our picture starts looking like this, where we have diversity R1, R2, R3, from choice of starting materials and diversity functional group one and functional group two by careful manipulation of the of the of the handles on the one five dyne. 
Okay, further, we believe that these are attractive building blocks because they are so easily activated to their anionic form. You treat these molecules with, with mild bases, such as potassium carbonate. Um, you form these allyl anions. And as I already told you from the Wigfield report, these are geometrically controlled, uh, as shown here, preferring this isomer. And these react selectively at the alpha position with, um, a little, uh, with electrophiles, such as alkyl halides, um, as shown here, to yield these E and alpha alkylated products. Okay, so for those reasons, we think that these are valuable building blocks. <clears throat> simple starting materials, simple manipulation of, of, the, of the building block to desired products. All right, so that gets us to now the multifaceted goal of my laboratory. We want to uh, start thinking about diversity of scaffolds. We want to address the kinetic and thermodynamic challenges that are associated with this Copley arrangement, and we want to address the fact that this is a racemic reaction. How do we make this enantioselective? And finally, uh, with respect to this sequence of events here, how do we go about finding attractive targets uh, to use this chemistry on, uh, to, to, to demonstrate the value of this chemistry? And of course, with any project, um, serendipity is really important. So things that, you know, come from studying this that we didn't expect, and also just in general thinking outside the box, um, you know, being inspired uh, by some of your findings. Okay, so today's lecture is primarily going to focus on addressing kinetics and thermodynamics of 3,3 disagonal 1,5 dynes, and I believe we have uncovered some general ways to do this. Okay. So recall that these styrene containing 1,5 dienes have high kinetic barriers, 29, and are not thermodynamically favored to progress. Delta G is essentially zero. That means it's isothermal. So the, the reaction from left to right is as favorable as the reaction from right to left. Okay, which means we can't really access these building blocks and take them forward in ways that we might want to. For example, by conversion to the amides and conversion of the alkene in various ways. Okay, and so if you want to have a general platform for synthesis, we need to we need to address some of these uh, thermodynamic and kinetic problems. Okay. Um, also, I had mentioned from the Wigfield work that you it's really challenging to construct quat centers adjacent to tertiary centers with styrene deconjugation. Look at this barrier, the kinetic barrier, it goes up to almost 32 kcals per mole. Okay, but even more challenging, the delta G is plus five kcals per mole. That means that the, the side is favored thermodynamically 99.99% to, to 0 0.01 on this side. So it's not a favorable reaction at all. And so we can't make quad centers adjacent to tertiary centers. We can't think about making molecules that look like this until we address the kinetics and thermodynamics of this transformation. Finally, benzene de-aromatization, extremely unfavorable in a kinetic sense, extremely unfavorable in a thermodynamic sense, okay? We cannot thinking, think about transferring an allylic group to the ortho position of a benzene ring um, at this point, and therefore we cannot think about targeting molecules that look like this, even though this would be a, a really valuable synthetic platform for making substituted benzene rings. Okay, so the first strategy I want to share with you is um, C4 traceless activating groups. Okay, here is the, the equation I had just told you about. What we found um, both um, computationally as well as experimentally was that by putting a four aryl group at this position, the barrier goes down from 29 on the subject that has nothing at this position to, to 20. Nine k per mole difference in the transition state. And remember, the magic number for a reaction to go at room temperature is 22. This is below that. So, Computationally, this tells us that this should be a room temperature copy arrangement that is highly 
exothermic. Okay, so it should be favored in this direction completely by simply adding on this four aryl group. And please note that these are functionally equivalent molecules. So if you do ozonolysis on this double bond, you end up with an aldehyde at this carbon. What happens if you do ozonolysis on this molecule? You end up with the same exact building block. So that's what I mean by functionally equivalent. We put on this four aryl group to address the kinetics and thermodynamics, and then we can convert them to the same overall targets um, by removal of that activating group. Uh, we also found that to a lesser extent, a methyl group can accomplish the same thing. Okay, from 29 to 25, so this one should go uh, with gentle heating, uh, you know, somewhere around 100 degrees maybe. Uh, but also importantly, the thermodynamics are looking pretty reasonable. Now it's at least negative uh, by 1.5 kcals per mole, which means that this side is favored um, uh, by about, by a ratio, of, I think about um, 80 to 20. Though don't quote me on that. Okay, uh, now I'll, I'll give you a few examples of, of what we did in a laboratory related to this. Okay, so we took this diaryl allyl alcohol and activated it in situ with acetic anhydride to put an acetyl group here. That makes it into a good leaving group. And palladium can then ionize that to form a palladium pi allyl complex. The base, DMAP in this case, deprotonates the alkylidine mononitrile to form the anion. And these couple together to make the 1,5 dyne. We never observe this. The only thing we observe is uh, the gamma allylated product, which means that this molecule is still acidic on this side. And so we can then add in allyl terbutyl carbonate and the palladium can reallylate uh, up on top. And now we did synthesize a new 1,5 dyne, one, two, three, four, five, six. However, the barrier for a simple allyl, recall from Cope's work, is much higher. And so it can be trapped out as this product here. Okay, and now ring closing metathesis can yield the six, seven aryl core here, common to meroterpenoid natural products such as frondas and A. And so we can make the core structure uh, in two steps via the bis allylation and ring closing metathesis protocol, and very nice overall yield over that two step sequence. Okay, um, one question that I often field is if you're only observing this molecule, how do you know it's going through a COPE rearrangement? It's in theory possible that the nucleophile could directly react at the gamma position to attack this carbon here. So we just directly make a bond between these two. Okay, that's a real possibility. Um, here's some work from the 1989 showing that palladium pi allyl complexes react regioselectively with nucleophiles um, such as malonate and melanonitrile at the side bearing the electron donating group, not the side bearing the electron withdrawing group. Okay, so we have a paramethoxy phenyl, we have a paranitrophenyl. Our nucleophile and our electrophilic component, the CC bonds are brought together at the side bearing the, the electron withdrawing group, which is the exact opposite stereochemistry as determined in this 1989 work. So therefore, the chemistry must be going for going forward by first a, an alkylation with the regiochemistry as expected, and then this undergoes a very mild uh, room temperature cope rearrangement to the, to the desired product and resulting in the flipped stereochemistry. Um, so everything is as expected. We've engineered these substrates to be highly reactive 1,5 dynes. Okay, so here's another substrate that is not a dicyano, but it has this Meldrum's acid group built into it. Okay, if you heat this molecule up to 90 degrees, no cope rearrangement occurs at all. Again, for similar problems, styrene deconjugation is a challenge. Um, but we can't we can't raise the temperature to see if there's if this is a kinetic or a thermodynamic problem because Meldrum's acid is actually a thermally reactive molecule. Meldrum's acid undergoes uh, two plus two plus two uh, retrocyclization. 
So essentially what happens is you form a molecule of CO2, a molecule of ketene right here, and a molecule of acetone when you heat this molecule to about 100 degrees. Okay, so our, our threshold for heating is 90. We can't heat these substrates up higher than 90 degrees. Um, and that can be one of the reasons why no one's ever put a Meldrum's acid into the 159 framework until our studies here, uh, which we recently reported in the Journal of Organic Chemistry. Okay, so let's use some of our tricks. We put this four methyl group onto the 1,5-dyne. As described earlier, this should um, destabilize the starting material and uh, therefore allow the reaction to go forward at a, at a better rate um, with both kinetic and thermodynamic favorability. And we calculated the barrier for this substrate. That's 24 kcals per mole in the transition state. Okay, so this should go with gentle heating. And the delta G now is negative, minus 5.1 kcals per mole, favoring this product over here. Um, I do apologize. I forgot to explain why adding these four groups um, at, at this position is so significant. Uh, let me just quickly step back and just make a, make a quick comment. Uh, when you add a group at this position, you, you cause some steric hindrance, okay, some torsional strain between the quat center and the group at this position. Okay, so that's gonna raise the energy of the starting material, okay? Um, secondly, this group stabilizes alkenes. Uh, you might recall from your physical organic chemistry classes that as you add substitution to an alkene, you stabilize it. Okay, so a methyl group will stabilize um, an alkene by hyperconjugation. If this was a benzene ring, uh, as we had, had done in the past, uh, that would be um, stabilizing through resonance, okay? All right, now with that being said, we can make these molecules here now in nice yields, treat it with sodium boryl hydride to reduce the uh, double bond selectively, treat it with aniline at 100 degrees to promote the ketene formation. And now you can easily access these, uh, these amides. And as I mentioned, the alkenes can also be selectively manipulated, for example, by cross metathesis uh, to make models that look like this with nice stereo control in the middle of the molecule and two valuable functional groups on either side. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through a full substrate scope. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at our recent work published in the Journal of Organic Chemistry. What I will quickly tell you is that when R1 is alkyl, and especially when it's isopropyl, it's the best. And when R2 reacts regioselectively with this molecule, is this the best? So for example, this could be alkyl, heteroaromatic, or aromatic, or a functional group such as, such as a nitrile. And the one major limitation to this work is your anion must react regioselectively with your allylic electrophile, meaning the anion must react at the alpha position. The electrophile must react at the side opposite to the functional group that you want to incorporate into your building block, so at this methyl position here. And so here's two examples of substrates that we looked at. Um, this one has a more bulky alpha tertiary carbon versus a methyl. So the nucleophile will attack here for steric reasons. And in this case, the nucleophile will attack here because it's thermodynamically preferred to re-establish styrene conjugation in your product. So R2 equals phenyl, we have the styrene. The molecule doesn't realize it's becoming a 1,5-dyne and it's going to styrene deconjugate. It doesn't have that, that, that privilege of knowing. Um, um, but we know, and eventually we will styrene deconjugate upon co-rearrangement to these types of structures here. Okay, and so as I was saying, we've developed a pretty mild uh, way of making molecules that look like this, and then we can manipulate these into molecules, for example, that, that look, like, look like this. They have um, amides and uh, other carboxylic acid derivatives such as hydro um, hydroxamic acids or trifluoromethyl ketones, for example. <clears throat> okay, uh, now I'm moving on to a second strategy for promoting copia arrangements that are not thermodynamically preferred, and that is through nucleophilic addition. Okay, so we know that 
this reaction is isothermal uh, with a barrier of about 28 or 29 kcals per mole. Okay, so upon heating to about you know 120, uh, 130 degrees, you should be able to have an equilibrium that's going back and forth. And these molecules are different molecules. They are isomers, but they have different reactivity. Most specifically, this one bears a highly electron deficient alkene. And so the thought was that we can promote equilibrium in the presence of a nucleophile, which will then add into the electron deficient alkylidine mononitrile and trap out the coat product um, uh, as, as shown over here. Okay, so we don't need this reaction to be favorable. We just need a little bit of this to be generated and we can trap it out. This is Le Chatelier's principle. Equilibrium will always reestablish itself and we can trap out this side of the equation and drive it forward. Okay, so here are our findings related to this. You can take a 1,5-dyne that does not have thermodynamic favorability, 10% conversion at equilibrium, and you can promote that equilibrium in the presence of Hunch amide, which is a source of nucleophilic hydride. It's a transfer hydrogenation reagent. And you can drive these forward to these reduced Cope products. Thus, we call this reaction the reductive Cope rearrangement to yield molecules that look like this. And then from here, we can take this alkyl malonitrile, treat it with base, oxygen, and amine, and yield these interesting uh, amides that have two stereocenters and an alkene functional group. Similarly, these cyclic 1,5 dyes are also not favored to undergo Cope rearrangement, much more than about 50%. So a little bit more favorable, but not one that you'd write home about. And we can drive these reactions forward once again by adding Hunch amide to the, to the reaction to yield molecules that look like this. And in this case, um, we had shown that you can allylate the nitrile and then do a ring closing metathesis with the Hoveda Grubbs catalyst to yield these hydroagiline cores that have functional groups such as the nitrile and malinate built into uh, the, 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 the framework. We have also shown that you can trap the in situ generated alkylidine melanonitrile with nucleophiles beyond hydride. So, for example, um, we found that a hydroxyl group tethered to the 1,5 diene um, will react with the, the electrophilic alkylidine melanonitrile. So, we do the cope rearrangement. It's not favorable. This is going back and forth. Eventually, this will rotate position itself for nucleophilic attack to form the tetrahydrofuran um, uh, and 67% yield. And this will be draw, driven all the way forward to the desired product uh, with three stereocenters. We see two diastereomers, five to one favoring the stereochemistry as shown. Okay, and again, we can do some interesting functional group into conversion, such as con conversion of the nitrile to an ester and metathesis of the alkene to the acrylate. Okay, I will share with you some unpublished work uh, related to the reductive co re rearrangement. Okay, and we were inspired by these tri-substituted cyclohexanes, which are important drug leads, okay? Um, so we have, you know, a drug-like functional group in amide, a drug-like functional group of carboxylic acid, um, substituted benzene rings, um, this amide here, another amide over here. So cyclohexanes substituted with drug-like functionality are important scaffolds for drug discovery. And we thought that we could take molecules that look like this, where we can have a functional group already built into the 1,5-dyne uh, on this portion, a functional group on the sixth position of the 1,5-dyne, and maybe we can make molecules that look like this uh, through a reductive Cope strategy. Okay, um, and here's the flatland drawing of this molecule. Here's what it looks like in the three dimensions. As you can see, it's a cyclohexane uh, densely decorated with functional groups. And here's what we found, um, that this styrene moiety prevents it from having a favorable equilibrium, okay, 50% um, equilibrium in the thermal studies. 
And what we found was that this, this reaction, this substrate can react diastereoselectively in the presence of Hunch ketone. And so here's our Zimmerman Traxler model. You want to form, you, you want the bond forming to be away from the large th uh, thalamid functional group rather than on the side facing it. So there is very little steric strain between this hydrogen and this phenyl group in the transition state. And we can drive this reaction all the way forward, 60% yield. We see three diastereomers, nine to one to 0.4, okay, of this product here. And you can recrystallize this to a single diastereomer. Okay, so now we have a, we have a building block that has a protected amine, which can be unveiled. We have a benzene ring, which of course are important scaffolds in drug discovery, and an alkene and a melanonitrile, which can be manipulated at will. So for example, uh, we convert the melanonitrile to an amide by that oxidative amidation process. Uh, we hydrogenate the alkene and we treat the enthalimid with hydrazine and mesyl chloride to functional group interconvert to molecules that look like this. Okay, so in pretty straightforward fashion, we can make some co otherwise complex molecules that would be um, challenging to make. All right, here's some representative examples of scaffolds that we made um, using this, uh, this uh, two-step, one-pot protocol. Okay, so we have various amides. Um, I'm sorry, we have various function groups at the four position, isopropyl, esters, and thalamids. Um, we have different uh, amide groups that we use. So we use morpholine to make uh, these morpholine amides. We used um, methyl uh, methoxy uh, amine to make wine rub amides. Um, we could dial in other functional groups under the benzene ring, such as a fluoro, a methoxy, a aldehyde, protected aldehyde, and even an orthofluoro group, um, all with reasonable stereo control uh, through this process and good overall yields uh, in the reaction. Okay, so um, hopefully at this point, um, I've given you a good idea of how to make your cope rearrangements go forward. I've described that you can add on a four aryl, a four aryl or a four methyl group onto your 1,5-dying scaffold um, to uh, both address kinetics, but also thermodynamics. And further, the other strategy that we have introduced is that you can add in some sort of nucleophilic component to your 1,5-dying that is otherwise not favorable and trap out your COPE product through um, nucleophilic addition to the alkylidine modern nitrile that is generated. All right, I think those are two pretty general strategies that are gonna have scope uh, beyond what we've done so far. And when this is an active area of our research group is pushing those two things forward. Okay, I'm gonna tell you uh, about the, um, an iterative variant using some of the strategies that we've developed, okay? So here's the molecule of interest. It's this four plus three adduct. Okay, so if you look closely, here is, for example, furan if X equals oxygen. Here is, you know, your chloroacetone. These undergo four plus three cycloaddition to the ketones, which you can then condense in melanonitrile. Okay, so a pretty straightforward molecule to synthesize uh, in two steps from, from, from feedstock chemicals. And we wanted to do iterative alkylations and cope rearrangements on these. So here's the first product, the first intermediate from a cope rearrangement. So you allylate and then do the cope rearrangement. And then you allylate and do a cope rearrangement again on the other side. And this stereo center here, this group, which is currently achiral, um, will control the first stereochemistry, the first three stereocenter set. And then on the other side, this stereo center will control the next sequence of events. And so we can set one, two, three, four, five, six stereo centers through this iterative cope rearrangement sequence. Now, what are these molecules potentially good for? The reason why we wanted to develop this, uh, because we thought that we'd be able to make these molecules pretty easily. And we thought that we could then do ring opening metathesis on the strained double bond. Okay, so what's going on here is the ruthenium is doing a two plus two retro two plus two to generate now this molecule here. 
And now we'll rotate this bond and we'll do a ring closing metathesis on one side, regenerate the ruthenium catalyst, which will re-engage on the other side to close up the other ring. So it's ring opening metathesis, ring closing, ring closing metathesis to synthesize these five, six, five systems from building blocks, which should be readily available and are readily available. And this project was inspired by terpene natural products that bear this 565 ring system. Uh, we thought it would be really nice to have a, um, a convergent strategy for synthesizing these from uh, simple, simple starting materials. And here's what we found out. Um, these substrates do not react as we anticipated. These double bonds are predisposed to one another to undergo ring closing metathesis, okay? So you engage on the alkene, it turns out, and then that just bites on over to the other side of the ring to close up to form the seven membered ring um, on the back side here. Okay, and you make molecules that look like that. Um, interesting in their own right, but not what we wanted. And we tried changing different functional groups to see if that would help favor the des desired pathway. In all cases, we were able to synthesize these um, polycyclic bridging systems. Okay, but if you recall our hypothesis, it was that the, this process would start by reacting with the strained double bond here, um, which is in line with um, the current understanding of ring opening metathesis chemistry. And so it was really kind of confusing to us that the reaction was not taking place at this double bond. And so we turned to our colleague, um, Adrian Roydberg um, to help us figure out what was, what was going on with this, this material. And what we found was that due to the highly electron deficient nature of this alkylidine melanonitrile, that this pi bond was not as electron rich as we needed it to be. In fact, it was transferring all of its electron density right on over to the alkylidine melanonitrile as seen in this illustration here. These are um, undergoing uh, what we call anchiomeric assistance, if you will, or anchiomeric um, activation, a pi pi stack. Okay, so the donor group is reacting with the acceptor group, and now this cannot engage the metathesis catalyst. Okay, so that gives us a, this, so we did this um, to understand why our chemistry wasn't working. Okay, and we figured out that if we just reduce the double bond, now this alkene cannot, of course, it cannot uh, pi pi stack with a uh, sigma bond. Now this should be electron rich once we do that reduction. And indeed, once you reduce that double bond, you start seeing the products that you want to see. Uh, these five, six, five ring systems, both the heterocyclic variants, such as oxygen and nitrogen containing, but also the carbon variants uh, that were inspired by um, that terpenoid natural product. So the 565 five hydrocarbon systems uh, are generated in nice yields. And once again, you can selectively manipulate the mononitrile, for example, to these amides. And so we believe that we now have figured out how to think about, how to better think about targeting these 565 five natural product ring systems uh, through this iterative cope rearrangement sequence. Okay, so I've got five more minutes about to talk with you, uh, chemistry, and that's good because I've got just a few more slides. And as I was alluding to, um, that we try to embrace serendipity as much as possible. Um, and we actually stumbled across what I think is some really interesting chemistry of these, um, these systems of when we were studying the ring close, the metathesis chemistry of these molecules. And what we found was that these systems, the simplest systems, um, pardon me, not the simplest systems, but the core um, alkylidine melanonitrile of these four plus three addicts is actually a one five diene in itself. Count with me here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and so um, what we found was that these systems bearing you know, some sort of R1, R2 group here react via cope rearrangement to ring rearrange from these bridging system to these fused five five ring systems. And this was really sort of confounding to us. Because um, recall, 
Um, the copier engine of, of one one of three three dye center one five dimes prefers to sit normally uh, with this conjugation on the uh, with conjugation between the nitriles. So that was interesting. I was going completely backwards. Um, and I should also point out that um, while we published on this in 2021, the simplest scaffold was reported in 1975. And this was not a reaction that was going to be valuable uh, in synthesis uh, because of the high barrier, 450 degrees. And so what we found was that by having these nitriles and some R1, R2 groups, that these can be brought down to 80 to 120 degrees. And now we're in the realm of synthetically practical and synthetically useful 3-3 uh, three, three ring rearrangements of this type. And we actually first observed this reaction on these ring closed systems. So you treat these molecules with the Grubbs metathesis catalyst at 110 degrees. You can notice this is higher than the previous systems, um, which were only going to 80 degrees. If you heat up more than 80, you see now that metathesis will occur and that these will rearrange to systems that look like this, a five, five, seven ring systems. And I know this is hard to see. I'm trying to put these bonds close to one another uh, as they are um, in the, in the three-dimensional world. But in the flat line, I think it's, it's easier structures to understand. So this double bond and this double bond undergoes ring closing metathesis. This Y group is on water nitrile. It undergoes three, three ring rearrangement to these five, five, seven hydroazuline uh, type cores. <clears throat> and here's three examples of substrates that we examined. Um, this substrate reacts selectively to break this bond. Notice one, two, three, four, five, six. It can react this way, but there's also a one, five, nine in the other direction. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and in our parent example up here, um, this is a symmetrical molecule. Now it's not. And it prefers to react by breaking this bond, likely because of steric congestion, but also because a methyl group is going to stabilize carbocationic charge at this side as well. You can exchange the oxygen group for a amine, and this reaction goes forward nicely. Um, you cannot change to a, a group that does not provide any donation. So you need an electron donor, oxygen, nitrogen. The carbon variant does not go under the conditions that we examined up to about 150 degrees. <clears throat> now onto some simpler versions of this reaction. Okay, so we do need, so we synthesize this molecule through deconjugated alkylation through the standard sequence I had told you about. And you heat this molecule up to 130 degrees. It does one cope rearrangement to start. And then that generates a brand new 1,5-dyne, one, two, three, four, five, six. And this rearranges again to this molecule here. And this is quite scalable. We can make about 800 milligrams of this um, pyrrolidine cyclopentane uh, derivative um, uh, in nice yield. Um, what we did find out, though, that is that the, the thermodynamics are not perfect. Um, this is a four, I'm sorry, three to one favoring this side. If you isolate this molecule and heat it back up, you will see a little bit of this in the flask. Okay, so our thermodynamics are not perfect for this reaction. Okay, and so what this tells us is that these are really great, likely because of high ring strain of these systems, and they undergo the most kinetic and thermodynamically favorable 3-3 three, three copy arrangements. One alkyl group is good enough to get you to about negative one kcals per mole. And if you remove this alkyl group completely, we never saw any copy arrangement on just the simplest versions of the scaffold. This is actually found out to be um, not a kinetic problem necessarily, but a thermodynamic one. This has a significantly positive delta G. Okay, so this brings me to the end of my talk today. I see it says 45 minutes since I started my presentation. So that's good. And again, I think I primarily focused on, on how to address kinetics and thermodynamics. 
uh, in this talk here today. This was the, the main focus. And uh, I think we're really poised now to, to think about some of uh, these other questions that we have. How do we address an anti selectivity? How do we identify valuable building blocks? How do we continue expanding the scope of this class of 1,5 dying uh, to thus, of course, impact all this other um, areas as well. You know, these are not these are not standalone problems. You address one, you often address a different problem that we're trying to target. And I, I shared with you some of our outside the box. It doesn't necessarily fit uh, this this equation here. <clears throat> so um, yeah, this is the future uh, highlighted now in orange. And I'll just give you a one slide teaser of some of the things that we're developing right now. Uh, which I'm extremely excited about. We have figured out how to do a lot of this chemistry in Nantio selectively using palladium catalysis. Uh, and so these are coat products that have uh, a piperidine scaffold, a functional group at this position, amides, and we can synthesize these in greater than 90% EE by a catalytic asymmetric chemistry. Uh, and we are also figuring out how to do de-aromative cope chemistry, uh, which is quite exciting. Uh, and finally, we are finding ways to synthesize quat centers adjacent to tertiary centers um, through the Coke rearrangement. <clears throat> okay, so with that, I'd like to thank my current laboratory that is pushing this chemistry forward. Um, and I also would like to thank the past graduate students uh, as well one more time uh, for all of their contributions to, to the research program. Um, uh, once again, thank you to the funding agencies and thank you to the Inspire uh, organ organization for inviting me to give this talk and to meet with you all today. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alex, uh, and uh, greatly appreciate your crystal clear explanations about the synthesis of various molecules that involves scope rearrangement. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the audience will have many questions. So uh, I would like to go for the audience for the question and answer session. So uh, please unmute yourself and uh, you can also use the raise hand button option available in the Zoom meeting, uh, in the Zoom uh, to tell us that uh, you have a question. So uh, the audience. Hello, Professor Alex. So it's very, it's Susanthi again. So it's very interesting and very um, impressive piece of work actually. So nice to see that you have gone this far. So this is actually a kind of like inspiring seminar that our students want to, uh, we want to actually inspire our students to think out of the box. And um, I feel very thankful that uh, joining with us Actually, I have one question. So when you start your career, so how did you uh, select the COP? Why did you select the COP rearrangement for the, actually at, at the first place to go with this, these studies? Thank you, Susanti. Um, first off, um, it's really a pleasure to be here once again. And I too want to inspire the students. I, I absolutely love chemistry. I love thinking about it. Um, it brings me great joy. Um, and if there's anything I can do to it, it it's, uh, it's inspire, I, I try to inspire people as well. Um, and I, I think there's really great opportunities um, in graduate school to, to be inspired and to, to, uh, to, to want to learn chemistry. You've got to find the right advisors and, um, and uh, it's really, it's just a great opportunity for, for, for people. Um, <clears throat> regarding your question, why did I choose the COPE rearrangement? You know, um, it's a good question. And it actually came because uh, of, a failed, of a failed attempt uh, at developing a, a route to hydroagonally natural products. Um, let's see, let me, let's see if I can, if, if I can draw this out. We wanted to,
Can you guys see this chem draw? Not yet, sir. We will see. Am I still sharing my screen? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Yes, now we can see. Yeah, so, you know, when I started my career, one of the ideas that I pitched to the University of Florida and other schools that interviewed me was the um, hope to synthesize natural products using the following strategy. We wanted to take um, these alkylidine melanonitriles derived from divinyl ketones. And if you guys are familiar, the divinyl ketones um, are Nazarov substrates, which maybe Susanti remembers the Nazarov was one of my favorite reactions in graduate school. Yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I brought it onto my career here. So I wanted to take these molecules that look like, like this and do a Nazarov reaction. Okay, so Nazarov would generate a bond here. All right, so if you look at, if you, if you follow along, move these double, move this double bond to here to make a bond, push this double bond up, push this double bond up. You end up with an anion at this position and a cation at that position. And the thought was that we could use this and react it with dipoles. Okay, as you can see now, these are electronically ready to react. I know this is a long answer. I'm, I'm getting to the end. The point is, uh, this was a complete, a complete and utter failure. Uh, we couldn't even make the starting materials. Okay, we couldn't make these, and so therefore we couldn't make molecules that looked like this. Uh, and then we sort of took a step back and realized, oh, you know what? If we sort of delete those double bonds, maybe we could find ways to manipulate these types of systems. And then you know, just read, and then I sort of was reading into these um, Canova novel addicts and stumbled across the Copley arrangement that you can put in allyl groups here. And then that was sort of it. And I thought, oh, you know, if you can put an allyl group on both at the alpha position as well as at the gamma position through Copley arrangement that we can use some sort of iterative um, Cope chemistry to uh, synthesize some valuable building blocks. So that's how I got onto the Copley arrangement through failure. And failure is really important because failure often makes for better ideas. This was a fun idea on paper, the original, but I think it made for um, a better idea and a better program down the line. Um, so, uh, sorry, I know that was a long answer, but I wanted to, I really did want to explain how I got onto this program and it was through failure. <laughs> Thank you, I will go Alex. back to my, my presentation now. Uh, Thank you, Alex. Okay, um, I'm uh, actually Viranja Karnaratna, uh, member of the department, uh, Dr. Groening. Uh, uh, I uh, have a bit of a historical perspective on the Coke reaction. I uh, am familiar, was working, uh, just entering to do my PhD in, in the lab of Dr. Edward Pierce who published in 1979 the synthesis of beta hematuline using the divinyl cyclopropane rearrangement. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not part of that uh, team who did the COPE rearrangement, but uh, uh, was, did something else. But uh, I joined the group in 1980. So I'm a generation ahead of you, at least, uh, in my synthetic organic chemistry career. But it's not a question, it's a comment, but a bit of a philosophical comment which is, um, you know, at that time, mid 1970s and early 1980s, co-prearrangement was finally used and uh, 
Paul Wender was uh, one of the proponents of uh, um, doing natural product synthesis at that time, uh, using copper rearrangement. Uh, familiar with his work, met him as well. Yeah. Um, uh, this I was at uh, the University of British Columbia with my PhD. Uh, so um, what, what I'm my my the, the the comment that I want to make is, you know, at that time they were the new kids on the block who were redefining copper rearrangement and what you could do with it at that time. And now looking uh, at the young generation of synthetic organic chemists, and you're certainly one of them, and who can now re redefine the corporate rearrangement and, and think of what new things you can do with it. And this. A very, very, very long time. Uh, in a in in a sense, other than teaching my undergraduate students, in a in a way that it has been used in synthesis, so that's why synthetic organic chemists are always green, uh, generation after generation, and they continue to redefine the landscape. And for that, uh, I'm appreciative of your seminar and um, uh, wanted to add a bit of historical perspective to your copre arrangement story. Thank you, Varanja. Yeah, that's really a great story and great comments. And let me just, let me add a comment on that as well. Um, you know, the, the literature is filled with, with, with diamonds in the rough. Uh, are we all familiar with that, with that metaphor? A diamond yeah. in the rough, something that could be polished to be something great. And I really thought that there, that, you know, that there was an aspect of coke chemistry that was still available to, 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 to yield um, new research results. Um, and I thought it was actually, you know, as I had, had like the title of my talk, um, using chemistry inspired by the historical Coke rearrangement. All right. It's important to dig back in the old literature and be inspired by it. It's so easy to um, also be inspired by the great, the great, very modern chemistry, you know, CH activation chemistry, for example. Um, uh, but it's also important to look all the way back and see it, you know, what people did, you know, 30, 40 years ago and see if anything has been missed. Um, and often there is things that, that have been missed. Yeah, so you, you're probably not even born in 1979, but still. Uh, no, nope, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with a lot of, of, the, of the, the divinyl cyclopropane cope chemistry though, um, that Paul Wender was working on. Uh, that was some beautiful chemistry and other people. Uh, it's really blossomed into a really nice area of research. Uh, I should also point out, you know, if I go back to some of these challenges. Right, so, you know, one of, just like to go along with the, is there a way to draw? Annotate. Not seeing an annotate option, but the, the uh, oh, one of the one of the ways of doing aromatic cope rearrangements is by putting on a vinyl group right here. I'm sorry, a cycle. I'm sorry, a cyclopropane group right here. If you put a cyclopropane here, you can actually do uh, aromatic cope rearrangements to make seven membered rings attached to a benzene ring. And so I say this reaction is very challenging. There are some solutions out there, um, though it doesn't involve a molonitrile at this point. It involves putting a cyclopropane at this position. So um, anyway, just to sort of harken back to your comment, Ranja, on the, uh, the divinyl cyclopropane rearrangement and tie it into some challenges that I had alluded to in the talk. Thanks, uh, uh, Alex, for that comment here. Yeah. We have time for another one or two questions. Uh, okay. Uh, so it looks like uh, the uh, audience is waiting for questions. Like if you have uh, more questions, we can uh, direct to uh, Professor Alex for sure. And since we are running out of time, I would like to uh, move to the uh, 
Willst du Nippon? Nippon? Thank you, sir. Uh, I consider it to be great honor and privilege to present the vote of thanks to this webinar on behalf of the Department of Chemistry, University of Peradini, and members of the Inspire team. Firstly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Alexander Brenny for accepting our invitation and spending his valuable time in sharing his knowledge on the latest development in research fields to simplify the synthesis of essential molecules. We found this webinar to be very informative and synthesizing helpful complex molecules is an exciting field that definitely attracts many inspired students from the University of Peradini. Professor Alexander Grenings, thank you very much for honoring us with your inspirational webinar. Next, I would like to thank Dr. Susanthi Jayasinghe for hosting the guest speaker today. Special thanks to Professor Ganahen again, head of the Department of Chemistry, for guiding us throughout the Inspire webinar series. I would also like to thank the attendees for supporting us with their presence, and I'm sure you found this exciting webinar beneficial. Before winding up today's session, I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to our next Inspire webinar, which will be held on 2nd of September, 2021 at 5 p.m. The invited speaker for the next webinar will be Professor H.M.N. Bandara, an Emeritus Professor of the University of Peradini. Please join us to share such valuable experience of teaching, learning and research over the past 40 years. Thank you all, have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. This really was an, a, a great morning. Thank you for so me. Much. Afternoon for you. <laughs> yeah, very good morning to Alex. Thank you very much once again for joining with us.